Well, and thank you, JD, for um, for fitting me in. Um, uh, I'm visiting Washington DC. Uh, I've been back and forth. I've always managed to miss the Dazers, so it was really nice to coincide with one and have an opportunity to come and speak to you. Um, as JD said, the Arts Catalyst is an interdisciplinary arts organisation. We're based in London. We produce contemporary artist projects that experimentally and critically engage with science. Uh, we work internationally, bringing people together from across disciplines to develop striking new artworks and to explore alternative ideas across science and culture. We've been going for 21 years, and uh, in that time we've commissioned more than 125 new artist projects and produced numerous exhibitions, events, and publications. While the Arts Catalyst work is, uh, I guess, primarily situated in the visual arts, um, the artistic, we tend to see our work or the artistic outputs of our work as experiences in which the medium is not the key criteria. Uh, and I've always been very interested in performance. So I'm going to talk just about three out of our 125 projects that we've commissioned, um, which center on or incorporate performance as an art form or as a tactic and consider those projects through the lens of performativity, um, a term which has increasingly entered the social sciences and humanities over the past two decades while I've been working. So previously used primarily within theater and the performing arts, the term performance or the notion of performativity is now often employed as a principle to understand human behavior. I suppose the notion that we perform our role in society has its roots back in the 1940s and 50s in the writings of scholars such as Irving Goffman, who in his very influential book, The Presentation of Self in Everyday Life, emphasized the link between social life and performance. And in the 1990s, Judith Butler famously, famously theorized gender along with sex and sexuality as performative. And um, <clears throat> scholars interested in the notion of performativity stress the active social construction of reality, as well as the way that individual behavior is determined by the context in which it occurs. The concept of performativity in the social sciences, um, I think sprang from its use by the language philosopher J.L. Austin, who argued against the predominant view in philosophy at the time that the chief business of sentences was to state facts. Um, in particular, he described a type of sentence which he called performance utterances, which perform a certain kind of action, such as, I name this ship. And this concept of performativity has been picked up, developed, and extended by theorists across many disciplines. And it's broadly come to be used to describe theories, models, or activities that affect or are affected by their actions, rather than being objective truths or observations. In the study of science until recently, experiment, which I guess is science's interaction with the world, was viewed as something rather secondary to theory. And technology was barely theorized at all. But a new generation of historians and philosophers have pointed out that science doesn't just think about the world, it makes the world and then remakes it. In the 1990s, Andrew Pickering argued that the studies of science should go beyond science's knowledge <laughs> to include the material, the social, and the temporal dimensions of science. Rather than seeing scientists as disembodied intellects making knowledge in a field of facts and observation, he suggests that we should start from the idea that the world is filled, not in the first instance with facts and observations, but with agency. So from the earliest days of the Arts Catalyst, I've been really interested in commissioning art in any medium that reflects this performative turn in science and technology studies and exploring how scientists shape society, culture, and the world and are shaped by them rather than art that simply represents scientific discoveries or technologies. And I'm going to talk about three of our performance projects that, that can exemplify this idea. The first one we were commissioned, uh, we were inspired to commission by my colleague uh, at the time, Rob Lafrenet, had been interviewing the Belgian artist Jan Fabre. And when he came back to the UK, he showed me a video that Fabre had made with the famous Russian artist Ilya Kabakov, in which Fabre represents the world of the beetle and Kabakov, the realm of the fly. Both of those artists use the beetle and the fly constantly through their work. 
So we invited Jan Farber to come and undertake a residency at the Natural History Museum in London, which is a working scientific research institution, as well, of course, as a world-famous public museum. And Fabre proposed to us that he would like to interview key entomologists, the insect scientists, each to be costumed in the guise of the insect of their focus of study. <laughs> Fabre himself was an amateur entomologist and the great nephew of the very famous Jean-Henri Fabre. I think this had a sway with the scientists because to our surprise, not only did they agree to participate and to be costumed, but there was such enthusiasm that we practically had to hold casting sessions. <laughs> Politically, and also because of their personalities, this is the, the keeper of entomology, the head of entomology, um, Professor Richard Vainwright. And this is the deputy keeper of entomology, Dr. Rory Post. So five scientists in the end took part in a series of conversations held in the museum's extraordinary backstage collection, which you don't really see. What you see is the tip of the iceberg. As well as discussing their scientific interest in the subject, each scientist was happy to perform a number of physical actions of the insects of their field of study. And through this, the film, which was shown in the museum as a two-screen installation, played on the notion of how the insects and their behaviors act on the humans who study them as much as being purely the objects of scientific curiosity. I'm going to show you a very little clip, uh, about two minutes. I'm going to apologize for the quality. It's, a, it's an old film now. It's 15 years old, and we've just had it digitized, and really the VHS was falling apart. But I think it's so delightful. And, uh, and Dick Vainwright, who's also an amateur jazz trombonist, is so delightful in it. I thought you just might enjoy it. Now, one of the most fantastic courtship displays you can see is in the great black and golden bird wings of Southeast Asia. <coughs> the females fly, as I described before, where somewhere fly where they think the male will be. And they fly along very, very, very steadily, about a meter above the ground, very steadily in a dead straight line like this. Now, if, if there is a male and he sees her, he flies out and initially he flies along just behind her, precisely behind. I think while he's doing this, he is assessing from her smell what sort of a female she is. And if he continues the pursuit, he then goes into what's called undertaking. This is rather like overtaking, except that he does it underneath instead of above or beside. my second example, we brokered and facilitated a collaboration between the French dancer and choreographer Kitsu Dubois and the multidisciplinary scientific biodynamics group at Imperial College. They worked together between about 2000 and 2005, studying control and movement of the body in weightlessness, including a number of zero gravity flights with the European Space Agency and the Russian Gagarin Cosmonaut Training Center that we organized. 
This work led to installations, performances, films, and scientific papers, as well as a whole new area of scientific research for the biodynamics dynamics group, which continued for many years. Uh, I'll show you a couple of teeny clips, one from the flight and then one from its manifestation on the stage. And this is a piece from one of Kitsu's stage performances. The spirit of Andrew Pickering's introduction of a performative image of science, which aimed to rebalance our understanding of science away from obsession with pure knowledge and towards recognizing science's material powers, Bruno Latour and Stephen Woolguy in the book Laboratory Life suggested that the aim of science is not to provide facts or representation about nature, but rather to perform it. Among their cast of actors are the new products of science, such as genetically modified organisms. This is the, uh, the American group, Critical Art Ensemble, who you may know. Their participatory performance, Gen Terror, which was performed as part of the Arts Catalyst Clean Rooms exhibition. In this, audience members could participate. They could grow and own a sample of transgenic bacteria. And after an intensive learning experience, they could make their own decision on the release of transgenic organisms into the environment. Since the 1970s, spectacularly recent de rapid developments in the biological sciences have become a source of concern as well as excitement, as previous speaker reflected upon. Many scientists warn of the dangers of commercial pressures to push forward with biotechnology, which is a te technique that can contain <coughs> many unknowns and defects which could lead to real and possible dangers to our health and to the ecosystem, as well, of course, as to advantages to health and to agriculture. Critical Art Ensemble's work from around 93 to 2006 sought to expose misinformation about biotechnology that came from sources such as market directives and science fiction. As few peoples have direct experience of working with biotechnology, the subject can seem abstract and too difficult for a non-specialist to understand. So a key critical art ensemble tactic was to bring this science out of the lab and to stage it in the public domain, giving people direct experience of common scientific processes and reliable information on a one-to-one -one basis. So I'll just wrap up and say, um, to conclude, 
in parallel with this notion of the performativity of science as a series of actions that affect the world, I think the tactics of performing science as we've explored this evening can focus attention on the impact that science has on the world in a very direct way. Thank you for listening and not falling asleep.